welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I am your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to introduce to you now. Joao Franco is a self-taught coach focused on nutrition and biohacking who has been on a carnivore diet for more than 1,000 days in a row. Wow, that is so cool. He strongly believes in a bio-individual approach and that animal foods are the key to maintaining a healthy body and mind while aging naturally. He has learned that a carnivore diet can be a tool to help keep people free from lifestyle diseases like atherosclerosis, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and obesity, among other things. His goal is to empower people so that they realize their full potential while questioning the dogmas of the mainstream health guidelines. Joao Franco, welcome to Boundless Body Radio. Hello, Casey. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm, it's uh, it's I, it's so good to be here with you. That's and great. I hope we can uh, help people. I, I totally agree. It's an absolute honor to host you. I, I hope that people um, get to learn from you and learn your message. Um, so we're glad that you're here. But tell us where here is for you. Well, here. Here is exactly 1,099 days as a carnivore. That's it's amazing. exactly today. One, yeah, almost... Uh, um, uh, 1,100 days, and uh, you know, if you came from the future and you told me that I would be eating only meat and fat for three years, I would say, Casey, get out of here. I don't believe you. <laughs> no, I agree. I haven't been as strict as you, but I started my carnivore diet in April of 2019. I thought it was crazy, and I wanted to try it for a month, and I just haven't stopped. <laughs> so nice. Uh, so be- nice. Before we jump into your story, you are calling in from Lisbon, Portugal, which is super cool. Um, we share the love of the Portuguese language, so I'm going to ask you to to for the listener, say, Joao Franco is a self-taught coach focused on nutrition and biohacking in Portuguese, because I want him to hear how beautiful it is. Okay. <laughs> I will. Okay. Um, João Franco é um, é, um, é um guia autodidata de nutrição e biohacking, okay. uh, e que está altamente focado em tentar uh, ajudar as pessoas a perceber que a saúde está nas suas próprias mãos. Ah, oh, love it. <laughs> Portuguese is such well, a beautiful yeah, language. It's... It's a beautiful language, I think. So. <laughs> now, you speak several languages, is that right? Uh, yeah, I do, I do. Gotcha. I speak uh, Portuguese, Spanish, um, French, uh, English, and I'm learning Russian. <laughs> wow, oh, that's super impressive. So yeah. um, we mentioned the carnivore diet already, but tell us um, tell us about your life. Tell us um, what it was like. I'm, I'm assuming you were born in Lisbon, is that correct? Yeah, I'm... I'm um, Born and raised in Lisbon, it's true. I'm 41 years old. And, uh, well, prior to carnivore diet, four years ago, or let's just say five years ago, I was, as so many of us, going through this uh, phase where I was with some extra weight. So I did what we all do at some point in our lives, which is to uh, eat less and, you know, subscribe the gym and start working out. And so I, I did lost a ton of weight. For me, a ton of weight is like three, uh, 30 kilos. So I'm, 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 I'm not very tall, but I was huge. I was really, really big. So yeah, I lost 30 kilos doing this, uh, you know, um, if, if it fits your macros approach, you know, uh, a lot of, uh, carbs, um, fruits and, uh, also high in protein, but very, very low fat, of course. And um, after uh, um, undergoing this, this, this uh, phase, I really, I felt like the weight was not my only concern because I was, um, I was, I still was a bit uh, hypertensive. So I had my, my, my blood pressure was uh, slightly higher than it should be. And I had several other aspects about my health, which I wasn't happy about it because, for example, I have been diagnosed uh, 10 years ago with uh, IBS um, and uh, I was also, uh, uh, I have been uh, in a depression for 15 years and I had gingivitis, uh, plaque, I had uh uh, for example, I had, uh, ah, hemorrhoids. Ah. Yes, finally. Sorry. It's an ugly word, but <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it is. yeah, I, I had hemorrhoids. So basically my digestive system was my main 
complication. Okay. And so on top of that, I was constantly hungry. So I was doing this six a day meal with, you know, eating every three or four hours. I was completely unaware that this was a sign that I was insulin resistant. So I was indeed, even after I lost weight, uh, I was, I was sick. Mm. I was very ill. And I started reading about it because my doctors were telling me that because of my IBS, I should increase my consumption of fiber. And I wasn't getting any better. In fact, it was getting worse. It was really painful, you know, to sit down on the toilet and you do what we got to do, right? So um, I started reading about different approaches and I started to read about the low-carb diets. And so, like many of us who are on a ketogenic or a carnivore diet, we we came through this door when we started to try a different diet, low on carbs. And I immediately started to see the differences. My blood pressure started to stabilize. I wasn't constantly hungry. I was having a... Uh, 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 larger you know i was i had larger meals and i was actually eating more calories and i was keeping my weight but i wasn't hungry all the time and then i started keto i i tried keto and i saw some improvements about my for example my brain fog i wasn't so depressed and and then i thought to myself well i'm here on I'm doing a keto diet, which is already very low on carbohydrates, but I have been reading about the carnivore diet and I love meat. So why not give it a try? And so here I am wow. <laughs> 1,100 days after. Wow. And it has been an amazing journey. And every day you learn something about it. It's just incredible. Wow. I think it's so interesting. We talk a little bit about the show, about the difference between average and normal. And a lot of those conditions that you talked about, like gaining weight, um, brain fog, depression, IBS, gingivitis, those things are not that uncommon. Like a lot of people experience those things. And so when enough people experience those things, it's kind of like an average, like an average amount of people can't lose weight very well, or an average amount of people are hungry all the time. But yeah, it's so yeah. interesting that that is not normal. We shouldn't accept that as normal because that's not how we're supposed to feel, right? Exactly. I, I completely agree with you. I think it's a crucial point. You just mentioned something really important, which is uh, 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 our society is driven by the um, normalization of some sort of pathologies. It's, it's for, for most people, it's normal to have headaches or or or, uh, for example, to have an occasional diarrhea, you know, uh, or acne. Nobody, nobody bothers to change their diet because they have pimples. Uh, and the truth is that these symptoms, exactly like you said, which become average, or let's just say that uh, considering the, uh, you know, the, 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 the results and the outcomes of different people in different places eating more or less the same diets, they actually have a lot in common. So these things that we take for granted, like, like uh, uh, digestive issues, let's just say, for example, heartburn, also another one. I think many people have heartburn after they eat a few hours or gas. You know, it's not normal to feel bloated after a meal. So exactly, I agree with you. Uh, they, they are not so uncommon and they are very, very average, and we just tend to ignore them. So I think that it's important um, to understand that we shouldn't normalize these pathologies. We we shouldn't accept it that it's you know it's like oh it's it's a part of getting old. No, it's not. I it totally means that agree. we're sick. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You mentioned doing um, research when you first got into this. Do you recall what resources were the most valuable to you as you were learning about this way of life? Well, um, yeah, I think that I can, for example, the first person, uh, the first uh, reference that I should make probably is, um, let me see, for example, Jason Fung, uh, he's an amazing specialist. You know, um, I, I, I started doing my research because um, 
my first goal, I remember actually, was something like this. I was Googling for, I'm not fat, but I'm always hungry. Something like this. It's, mm. you know, sometimes we make, uh, we, 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 we write our own keywords when we're searching for something. And then I, I started to understand that I, I wanted to do some research about fasting or insulin. Or uh, I wanted to understand what is to be insulin resistant. And so, yeah, I think that the first book that came to my my library, let's call it, because I have a huge library right now, um, uh, was Jason Funk, probably. Yeah. Mm. yeah. He, we love his work. His work is just so good. Um, I really he's love amazing. his concept. Yeah, he's awesome. I love his concept of, of uh, blaming the victim you know, telling people they need to reduce their calories and exercise more. And then when somebody goes out and tries it and it doesn't work, well, we just tell them yeah. they didn't do a very good job yeah. with it. I love, I love that concept. Yeah, true. <laughs> it's really great. It's really great. You mm. know, and his, his, uh, his approach, his, his, uh, hormonal approach to these, uh, 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 energy balance question, which is probably one of the most fracturing subjects of all in, in, in the midst of nutrition, uh, you know, people who speak about nutrition, people, even people who who know what they're saying about nutrition, there is some sort of a section like a war, you know, be uh, about calories because we we still think about calories. And most of us, we came we come from from many years of doing that, you know, taking into account that calories do matter because if we want to lose weight, we need to be on a calorie deficit. But Jason Funk, he puts it in such a way that you understand that it has nothing to do with where it's not the focus because it's not about the weight in the end. It's about the health. It's, it's not about counting uh, those tiny little monsters that shrink your clothes when you're sleeping. It's, it's about giving your body proper nutrition in the right time, which is when we're hungry. Mm. Yeah. So it's much more simple. Yeah. Mm. I mean, it, we sh we shouldn't be counting calories. We can. It, I, I I won't say that it's not useful. It's not completely useless. Let let's put it this way. But the variables, you know, like Ted Naiman, for example, he says that if we're going to consider calories, there is a much higher problem, a much bigger problem with the calories out question than the calories in, yeah. because there are so many variables that we cannot possibly uh even get close to a uh, 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 you know uh, the right numbers it's just crazy so i think that satiety is much more interesting than a calorie surplus or a calorie deficit mm. and if i'm if i'm satiated with what i'm eating it's much more and if i'm eating uh, nutrient dense foods it's much it's much less likely that I will overeat because I have no need for that. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. We've had Ted Damon on the show. He's just, he's so great. We love his work also. And I, I'm so glad oh, you use the word satiation. Yeah, he is amazing. Yeah. And I'm just, I'm so glad you use the word satiety because I, again, I think that the average person probably doesn't even understand what satiety feels like. The ability to move about your day and do whatever you want without feeling tied down to food all the time is such an amazing feeling. And I don't think on average people know what that's like. Although I do think that's the normal human state. I, I couldn't agree more. Mm. It's one of those words, you know, if the wind came and uh, took out the not important words, uh, this word sticks. If, if we, if we, um, rub the, uh, unimportant words away, satiety is one of the main words. Exactly. Uh, I would say that the common person doesn't know. Yeah. I agree with you so much on this. The, 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 the common person, you know, doesn't even know what it is to be hungry because they think that they are full, uh, eating small meals every three hours. And this is completely the opposite of satiety. Mm, I totally agree. I, thank you for explaining that. That was so well said. We, you, you <laughs> described your transition, um, 
through the diets and you mentioned that a lot of people, you know, kind of transition through those diets the way that you do. And I completely agree. That's how I did it. Um, that's how many of my clients did it also. Um, and you mentioned a lot of, um, you know, steps and levels of more benefit, but there also, we have to acknowledge that there are some things that you have to sacrifice. There's some things that you have to readjust and that can be quite challenging. And I think that, that, uh, you know, hinders a lot of people from even trying the diet. So what, what were some things that were actually kind of difficult for you or difficult to adjust to as you were changing your diet? Well, it's a great question. And the first thing that comes to mind is social life. Mm. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, um, it's one of those things that when you stay on a carnivore diet for three years, you have to mention it. The thing is that, um, I would like to start by saying that it has very little to do with what you put in your mouth. This whole thing about changing, about um, re rewiring your brain, I can say that. Uh, it's like, it's, it's, it's the way you think about food, but also about so many other things. And you realize that there is nothing more important than your health. There is nothing more important than feeling great there is nothing more important than than not being sick i don't miss my ibs i cannot possibly say that having uh, a good time with my friends getting wasted on food or drinks is more important than feeling great and like i have a, an optimal health i have never been in such a in, in a better uh, physical condition as I am right now with 41 years old. And I'm thinking, you know, this is so important. Why should I give it away for the sake of comfort, you know, to be accepted by others? Because people do look at you like the odd one out. You know, this guy is so strange. Oh, my God, he eats meat only. He, he eats only meat for three years. He is weird. I have been with friends, we have talked about it, and many people don't understand, but the fact remains that it's my decision. And so I can say that my friends will either accept me or, you know, they won't. And I have some friends and and I my friends accepted me after a while, you know. At the beginning, they all say the same, you know, like you're such a crazy, you know, you're crazy, but now they're like, Joel, I know that you will not be eating rice, so it's okay. I can be with my friends or I can even be with them while they're eating and I'm fasting, but I'm still paying attention to them. It's really great. So, yeah, I think that social uh, life is the first thing that I would like to say that in some way was sacrificed or changed. The other thing I would say that, mm, for example, uh, even close, close relationship with some people, because you realize that you're surrounded by relatives, by friends who are constantly harming their bodies. And so there is this sense of um, consciousness, like you, 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 you want to do, you want them to be well right you you it's natural that it's only natural that we wish the people that we love we wish that they are healthy that they that they can do better choices and you realize that everyone around you is addicted to food and so this is another thing is like we're we we are the odds the odd one out uh, we we are like we're we're watching everybody and everybody around us is simply in slow motion because mm. they are drugged mm. in food. So I have this feeling like I'm walking in the street and I'm looking at people in the supermarket while they're buying their groceries. And I'm thinking these people, they are completely addicted and dependent on this way of eating. Wow. You know? We just had interviews with Jane Steele and also Sean Freeman. They are both food and especially sugar addiction specialists. And boy, we learned a lot mm -hmm. about how addictive, mm -hmm. truly addictive food and, and especially sugar can, can be and how much harm it can cause. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, yeah, I, I, I completely agree with that. And I, 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 I always uh, talk about myself as a food addict. 
food addict. It's very important to understand that the addiction of food is real, uh, namely sugar, of course. Um, and I think that we need to understand that the first step is to admit that this is a serious illness, a serious condition. There is no difference between, uh, you know, like a, a, a drug user, uh, an alcoholic, or a person who is constantly eating sugar. Uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, the reward system, um, uh, system the, in, in our brain, um, there, there are proof. There is proof that there is a, a, a you know, an increase in dopamine secretion. So it's, it, this is all in the end. It's all about the balance of our neurotransmitters in the brain. And if we're eating constantly sugar, the brain sees sugar and wants more sugar because it releases dopamine. So we're addicted to this reward. So we eat something sweet, and our brain says, "I want more of this." So we're completely hooked on this, whether it's bread or fruit or, or I don't know, it's just so overwhelming. And to realize this, it's a game changer completely. Wow. Yeah, that's very well explained. And we, that's definitely something we've learned a lot more about. So what you mentioned, you know, having the better conditions and all those things, what other things have you learned about yourself along this, along the way about your, you, you know, your journey and, you know, you as a person, how are you showing up differently in the world now that you've gone over a thousand days on this diet? Well, the first thing that I can say is that I am looking forward for the next 1000 days. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> there is no way that I'm going to go back um when you when you see the changes in your body and your mind it really it really makes you uh i mean it makes me believe uh i have my own uh, proof you you know we can read all about it about what other people say on the carnivore diet and the in the end you see that there are so many things in common you know for me, it's like this, you know, if we are what we eat, or should I say we are what we can absorb, and if we're eating nu uh, nutrient-dense foods which are so easily absorbed, then we are what we eat indeed. And I want to continue to eat meat and fat because I feel like it has changed the way I think. It has changed the way I reason um, it has changed, um, uh, the way I, I deal with other people. It has made me, it has made me, made me, uh, more, um, more, uh, in some way more spiritual. I can say that I, 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 I think that I have become, you know, uh, more, um, I want to help more people. I want to try and reach people and try to, it's, it's one of those things when you say it's, almost too good to be true. I can say that it applies, but in this case, it is true. And I'm not even selling anything, you know? I'm just saying, look, this is so amazing. I want other people to try it, you know? It's like, I'm not forcing anything, of course, but but I, I want them to see for themselves what I am seeing, what I am experiencing. This is great, I think. Wow, dude, that is so amazing. And I noticed all of those exact same things. I was already feeling pretty good on a, you know, low carb ketogenic diet and I, I enjoyed it and I didn't have any health issues, but when I went fully carnivore, my ability to deal with stress was totally different. My, I would absolutely say that my spirituality increased and my gratitude mm -hmm. increased and just the way I would show up in life was totally different. I can completely relate to that. I'm so glad he said that. That's so cool. Yeah, I, I I was listening to to what you were saying, and it came something to my mind. Could it be? And it's a question. It's a really interesting uh, theme for a reflection. Could it be, be? All this happens because we, in some way, become closer to our um, true nature. Mm. You know, I, to me, that makes a lot of sense. That it makes a lot of sense. I, you know, when I sit down for my one meal a day, I, I feel mm -hmm. happy and I feel grateful. I realize that 
there is a life that lived a life and had a death. And that helps me contemplate my own death a little bit more, which again, increases spirituality. And, and I, I do think, yeah, it's a, it's a really great way to phrase that question. Yeah. I think, I think it is a more true way that we have lived and just, just living that way again. Yeah. I, yeah. Wouldn't it increase our gratitude and compassion and spirituality, all of those things that we have become so far disconnected from? I think so. Mm. I think so. Yeah. Uh, we are so, um, this is why is, uh, these conversations for me, they are really amazing because um, it's good to to speak with someone who is going through the same, you know, it's like we're exchanging uh, um, our, our experiences. And we realize that, for example, we don't know each other, but we already have so much in common just by doing this, you know, we're having the same diet more or less, and we are going through things which are overwhelming. You know, it's, they, they are top to bottom from the inside out worth noticing and spreading. So it's like, for example, I was looking the, the other the other day I was looking at my dog and I was thinking like this, uh, look, this dog, he's always, always hungry. I mean, he has his meal, but if I gave him a, a bit of meat every hour, he would eat it, even if it meant that he would be sick to his stomach. So I'm thinking that this is in some way what separates us from other animals the fact that he doesn't know that there is a meal tomorrow that there is a meal in two days he doesn't know because for him for a dog there is no tomorrow that's right and i think that in some way this is an uh, an animal instinct from which we became so separate we drifted from this lack of comfort in some way so we are living in an environment which is completely uh uh it's this abundance of 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 comfort it there, there is everything we are hungry we just need to open the fridge and take something to eat we are constantly uh comfortable and the fact that we became like this as a society, and we, of course, we can go back to the beginnings of agricultural um, civilizations, and we realize that it was in these, in some way, uh, it was the beginning of the end, because we just got further and further away from this primitive uh, 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 instincts. And so, yeah, I think that in some way, you and I were here exchanging these experiences, and we're talking about these things, and we come to realize that we changing our diet has, in some way, made us closer, or it, it has put us in a direction where we are closer to our primitive uh, instincts. I believe. I wow, I love that. We are going to do a, an interview with uh, Mickey Bendor. I'm not sure if you're familiar with his work. He's yeah, in Israel. Yeah. I also um, follow him. Yeah, yeah he's mm -hmm. great, and he talks a lot about those same things. As humans, we needed to communicate to cooperate, and so that's why we have a language, and we can talk about tomorrow. Where you're right, the dog doesn't know where the next meal is coming from, just knows that he needs to cooperate with us, <laughs> so that we can give him the exactly. food. And as long as he doesn't bite us and is useful to us, exactly. then we'll keep him around. <laughs> wow, yeah, yeah that's exactly. so that's so amazing. So tell us, tell us how you define your own carnivore diet. What does that look like for you? What are some of the things that you do? Okay. Um, well, I would like to start uh, by saying that I really admire, for example, Amber uh, O'Hearn. Mm -hmm. I really admire her. And I am doing at this moment what she calls the lipivore, which is a high fat carnivore. I have been trying it since uh, January. Um, and I'm really happy about it. And I, uh, and I started to cut on the salt, for example. But what I do is basically the fattiest cuts of meat. It's what I eat. Uh, I drink coffee. I like coffee. And I don't feel like I should give it away because I have tried uh, for three and a half months without coffee. I didn't feel anything worth uh, noticing. So if it, in some way, if I saw that it, did this or that, and I saw that there's positive reaction or a negative reaction, I would probably cut it. But I decided to keep coffee because I really like it. And um, so it's practically, I think it's 
yeah, it's the only non-carnivore aspect of my of my diet because I eat mostly beef. Uh, I eat also some pork, and I eat very few, uh, um, not so much. Yeah, chicken. I eat fish every once in a while, even though I'm in Portugal, which means that I have access to wonderful, fresh, uh, wild caught fish. I do eat it occasionally because, to be honest, it doesn't fill me as beef or uh, or pork. So yeah, I think it's my uh, I, dairy. Also, uh, I eat cheese every once in a while, just a bit, because cheese is a complicated thing for me. Because being a sugar addict, if I eat cheese, it can trigger some binge episodes. So it, it is possible if I eat too much cheese, I will keep buying cheese because it really gives me this high, you know. So mm. I, I, I try to control a bit on my dairy. Yeah. Mm. Um, I, we get asked that question all the time with dairy. It seems like, well, first of all, you're right. I think cheese is, is complicated. It's really nuanced. Um, different types of cheese, I think are different depending on how long they're aged. Um, but, but yeah, the dairy question is one we get all the time. And that one to me, it just seems like you need to really test it out on yourself. And some people seem like they can tolerate it really well and it doesn't cause a problem and other people, I think it does. And so I, do you find with the people you work with that they have to kind of test that one out it's the only rule i think um and i think that in so many ways it's uh this approach and uh, as you said at the beginning i do believe in a very bio individual approach and um, even though we have the same organs and they are supposed to do the same things there are so many variables and so in some way we are quite unique uh, especially in the the way we react to some foods, considering where he came from, what situations we had that we had to solve. So I think, and dairy is a perfect example because what I always say to people is like this: Look, dairy is wonderful, right? I mean, um, it's tasty and it's nutrient dense, but you need to try for yourself to see what is your reaction. And dairy is a perfect example of this because, and then I can say that so, uh, some people come to me and they tell me, João, it's so difficult to stop eating cheese. And I tell them, let me interrupt you right there. Listen to what I'm going to tell you. You will not believe how important it is what you just said. There is a biochemical explanation for this uh, for this, what's happening with you. You cannot stop eating it because the truth is that especially cow milk, because it's, you know, there is this difference between A1 and A2 milks, but milk contain casomorphins. This uh, uh, casein, which is this uh, protein in milk, contains casomorphins. And ca casomorphins, they are actually, they are, it's some sort of opioid. So this this whole thing about not being able to stop, it's because it gives you pleasure. So in some way, there is this release, there is this hormonal and uh, biochemical uh, uh, you know, event which makes you want to eat more cheese, especially the beta-casomorphins. They are the perfect example. So yeah, cheese is addictive and there is a biochemical explanation for this. So if you feel like cheese in some way is, you know, um, slowing down your, 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 your process, if you feel like it's, you know, if you feel like you're bloated after because dairy can be inflammatory. And I would say that in most cases it is inflammatory, but there you go. You need to check for yourself. Try a week or two weeks or three weeks without dairy and then go back see if you feel some kind of difference because you know dairy can can bind your stool for example it can slow down your you know it can do a lot of things so i i i always tell people you need to try for themselves and you know what casey i came to realize that most people sometimes they want more than that because they want you to tell them exactly what to do and i cannot do that because there is no one size fits all. You have to do it for yourself. 
we keep asking that exact same question to so many of our guests. Just come on the show, tell us what to eat, then we'll stop the podcast and everybody can just do that and they can go and live their life. And we keep getting disappointed, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, interesting. I completely understand. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, for example, we can we can in some way compare with other approaches. You know, it's like there is this uh, this uh, whole bunch of gurus in the internet. They are telling you how much to eat to lose weight. You know, uh, 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 lose lose uh, five kilos in one week. I will tell you how. And people they do believe in that because they what they are hoping is um, a, a silver bullet. What they are looking for is a magic pill, something which will, you know, like a shortcut. And there is no shortcut with a carnivore diet. I tell you, when I came to the carnivore diet, it was difficult. My 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 uh, adaptation to the carnivore diet was not easy. I remember going to work and I had... Once I had an episode, and I can tell you this because it's really funny, and it's the kind of things that carnivores talk about. I wasn't prepared for this. You know this fa- uh, this sentence: "Never trust a fart." <laughs> I know exactly it's, what you're going it's to say. True. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Oh my god. You know, uh, it's like I was. I, I was when I was. You know. Pre pre low carb, I was really proud. You know, it's this, you know, guys talk about it. They make fun of it. You know, people make fun of of farts, and they they fart in different ways and tunes, and they, you know, farting is funny. <laughs> but when I came to carnivore, I realized that I lost my my fun. I wasn't fun anymore <laughs> because I was farting much less. <laughs> and one day, I was on my way to work, and I thought, Oh my God, here comes. No, it wasn't. Oh, it wasn't. No. And I had to go back. Oh, I had no. to go back to change my my jeans. I had to change my pants because I, you know. Oh, yeah. oh. Wow. So Because it, so many things change from the inside, you know. Sure. And I mean it's there is no there is no gas, there is but of course the adaptation was complicated. Yes. And many people many people mentioned this adaptation with some uh, discomfort, some diarrhea. I believe that it's the uh, transference from a high carb to uh, not only a low carb, but especially a high fat diet. Yep. Because it changes a lot of things in terms of the uh, function of your organs. Wow. You know, like your 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 gallbladder was lazy all her life, and now suddenly she is working like hell because there is so much fat to digest. <laughs> yeah, it's totally true. I, I'm so fortunate that that never happened to me, but I the, the times that it was very, very, very close were times like mm-hmm. at the gym where there was a bathroom, at least on my level, and I would all of a sudden, I'd be training somebody and all of a sudden people would be staring at me because I would be at a dead sprint for that bathroom. And like, I had some very, very, very <laughs> close calls. That was a close call. Yeah, close it, call. it was a close call. Wow. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, I already know how you're going to answer this, um, but how do you feel about organ meats? Oh, I love it. I love it. I am completely in favor of this nose to tail approach, but I should, as a disclaimer, I should just say that I know that a lot of carnivore people do not eat offals or, 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 um, organs. So there is no way that it's mandatory, but I do love it. And it's very, very tasty and it's very cheap and it's very nutrient dense. So definitely for me, yes. I eat all sorts of organs. I eat, uh, for example, I eat uh, lungs, I eat heart, I eat tongue, I eat um, intestines, I eat what I can eat. I even eat, uh, I, I already tried the, gall, the gallbladder and, and the spleen, and it's so tasty. Mm, wow. And of course, liver, right. Yep. The king of the king of of organs is definitely liver for me. It's so tasty. Mm. Wow. I love that you mentioned all of that. How do you how do you think about the protein to fat ratio? It sounds like you're increasing your fat a little bit more recently, but is that something you vary quite a bit? Is that something you pay attention to every day or is it just something that you'll change for a little while and see how you feel and then change back? 
Well, I can say that I like to experiment. So in the beginning, I was doing what other, I was doing what I read uh, that other people were doing, and they were considering. You know, there was this. Um, for example, I tried the fifty-fifty. You know, like uh, a, a gram of protein and a gram of fat. I tried uh, one point five grams of fat uh, and one gram of protein. So I think that I tried all the ratios. And to be honest, I realized that when it was higher protein, or should I say less fat, okay, I noticed that there was an increase of appetite. So what I did was I tried, for example, a higher fat carnivore diet, and I realized that I could... Mm, make longer periods of fasting. I am an OMAD guy like you. I have been doing OMAD for three years, but occasionally on weekends, for example, I can fast for 48 hours uh, or, or I can have two meals and then fast for 36 or even 72 hours. For me, it wasn't important when to eat, but I was, I guess I was trying to signal to, to understand my uh, satiety signal and my hunger signal, which is sometimes very complicated and even more complicated than the satiety signal because we're so used to eat by the hour, you know, like it's time to eat. Is it? Is it time to eat? Why? Why it's time to eat? Because it's socially acceptable that we should eat at eight? No, I need to get away from the clock. So I started experimenting with fasting and I realized that what was working for me was a higher fat because in some way when I eat less fat I feel like in some way I am maybe because I'm burning more glucose I don't know it can be uh, and it's something to talk about of course but I feel like when it's a higher fat I feel like in I feel like mm, mm, my mind works better uh, so it could be the effects of more ketone bodies probably uh, so yeah, I like to experiment, but I definitely, I'm going to keep this lipivore, which I love, Good. which is more or less, I would say it's 70, 70, 30 or 80, 20 in, wow. in percentage, wow. 70% fat and three uh, in, uh, in 70%, 30% protein. Yeah, mm. probably it's my favorite so far. Gotcha. What, what are your favorite types of fats to add to get to those percentages? Because unless you're eating a very, very fatty cut of meat, that can be a bit of a challenge. I can I can answer in two ways. So yeah, the first thing, starting by by what you said uh, in the end, uh, yes, definitely, I eat mostly the fattiest cuts I have, uh, which is uh, mostly is uh, from the belly, right, from the neck, and uh, so these cuts are really, really, really fat. There is no need to add anything. Uh, I do a lot of uh, slow cooked meats, so this fat is rendering for several hours. Um, but when I do eat something leaner, like for example uh, organs, they are literally muscle. You know, I add butter. I also cook with suet, which is really you know beef tallow, beef tallow, and uh, lard. So basically, I use everything in my arsenal. <laughs> <laughs> Those all sound really delicious too. <laughs> now, sometimes uh, we get some pushback, and I personally, I wish more people, maybe not everybody. Well, I, I wish everybody would try a carnivore diet at least once in their life. Give it a really good try. Do it strictly. Do it for 30 days and just see. Just see how it feels. But sometimes we get pushback and people don't want to do it. Um, would everybody benefit from adding more animal products to their diet, even if they're not a strict carnivore, in your opinion? Definitely, yes. I would, I would say that it's imperative that people add more animal foods to their diet because... And there is a certain context here, which I cannot not talk about it, which is this uh, whole scenario of the plant-based uh, bias. And so, yeah, we're, div we're living in difficult times because we're being pressed in some way to uh, lower our uh, consumption of animal products by everyone, the government, 
at schools, in the pharmacies, the doctors, in the television. Everybody is telling you to eat less animal foods because they say that it's not good for health. They say that it's not good for the environment. And we know different. We know different because when you enter the carnivore diet, it's impossible not to study the sustainability theme, for example. I mean, I want to understand if what's doing so good for my body, I want to understand if it's really, really that bad, as they say, and it's not in the end, because there is always two sides of an equation, right? I mean, there we can talk about um, the, the problems with feedlot production, but we should also talk about the uh, monocrops. So agriculture and livestock, they have the same problem. Man is oriented by profit. So we need to start looking for alternatives, and there are alternatives. Uh, so, um, and then, and then there is there is this uh, thing which is like uh, we we cannot ignore that um, we came. I mean, our ancestors they ate a lot of meat. I always say this in a funny way, but it's like this, you know, if man's present or if man's presence on Earth could be shrinked into a, an easier understandable time frame we could say that man has like, like for example a week let's call it a week it's easy to understand the time frame uh, so uh, the uh, man uh, homo sapiens has been eating meat for seven days and has been planting vegetables and cropping veg and cropping cereals for 40 minutes yeah. And has been counting calories for 20 seconds. <laughs> How can meat be bad for you? Folks, wake up. Meat is good for you. Okay. This this whole thing about plant-based, you know, it's just it's a push. It's a it's an agenda. So yes, everybody would benefit from eating more meat. And it's not. It's not uh, uh, just a coincidence that 84% of vegans go back to eating meat. That's right. Okay. And I, I know actually some, I know personally some examples of people who were vegetarians and started eating a carnivore diet and they are amazed. They are completely amazed. They are binging on meat, on raw milk because they have been malnourished for so many years and they are recovering. They thought they were healthy, but they were not. Wow. They had fatty liver. They had all sorts of problem, co cognitive problems. So yes, I would say that everyone will eventually see some benefits of, of having uh, more animal products in their diet. Wow, I love the way that you explained that. That was great. So you're improving your life. You're feeling great. You've been doing this for three years. You are experiencing more generosity. You are getting very, very smart about the topic. And so, of course, you want to go out and help other people. So what ways are you using your knowledge and information to help those, you know, you mentioned earlier, the loved ones around you? What, what, what kind of coaching tools do you use to help the people that need this information? Um... Well, that's a great question. I will try to answer my best. Um, I, I'm not very good at summarizing uh, sometimes, so I get I, t I have this natural tendency to, tendency to get a bit lost. But I will try my best. So it's like this: I I have a goal. Okay, there is one goal which is above on which is on top of all goals. I want to help my mother because my mother is. Um, she has chronic kidney, kidney disease, okay? Wow. And so I love my mother. She is an amazing person, an amazing woman. She is a true warrior. And, but, but she has been diagnosed with uh, uh, CKD, CKD for uh, like 15 years ago. And she is hypertensive. So yeah, she has high blood pressure. And she already started having some... Um, uh, gout attacks, you know, so this is what I want to do. And I decided that instead of, instead of picking on her brains, you know, uh, uh, constantly telling her what to do and, you know, we end up quarreling or something like this. I 
redirected my energy into helping other people. So in some way, what I'm really hoping for is that one day she will understand that what I'm doing can actually benefit her. So yeah, she would benefit from changing her diet, but I'm not doing it directly to her, but I am doing it because of her. So my, my personal approach to a person is like this. Uh, you come to me and you tell me that you want to understand what, what is to eat, what it means to eat uh, 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 an animal-based um, uh, diet. You know, like you only eat this and that, and don't you miss this, don't you miss that. So I always speak with people first. It's this, I do not have a pamphlet. I do not have a program like there is one, two, three, four, five steps. No, there is always this conversation with the person. So it's in some way one-on-one, -on -one, really one-on-one. -on -one. So, um, and my, my goal is to, above all, it's not about pushing the carnivore diet. I'm not pushing a carnivore diet. Many people with whom I work, they actually eat vegetables, okay? So what I'm telling them is that meat should be, the base of their diet and that it's important that they eat more animal products so we have this you know we 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 there there is this freedom because and i feel like in some in some ways there are so many people who are pushing a, a certain method a certain fixed idea a certain fixed idea and i think that it's important that we understand that we cannot uh, apply those parameters to everyone because everyone is different. Wow, that's so beautiful. I, I I agree and love all of that. I think that's amazing that you work with people in that way. And and speaking of beautiful, you have your Instagram page and it is very well done. Um, what you do, you post a lot of pictures so of your meals. And there's a particular picture that you posted a few days ago that has more likes than all of them. And it's a picture of the last 100 meals that you ate all together in this gorgeous <laughs> picture. What, how did you come up with that idea? That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, well, I have to admit that there is a certain advantage of being a graphic des a graphics designer. I am a graphics designer, so I do my own branding and um, I like to, you know, I like to work on my, on my logo, to use my fonts, my colors, the type of message. So I think about it, uh, before I do it, you know, like it's it's really great that that people can look at you and remember, look, this is carnivore I am, or this is carnivore car carnivorous Aurelius, for example. There are so many carnivores out there who are trying to communicate in their own fashion. So uh, my idea was like this, you know, the the third carnivorsary was coming, and I thought I'm going to post something to inspire others to do something for a long time. Because I think that what, for me, the most amazing thing about doing the carnivore diet is that I can keep it for myself. I can keep going. It's very easy to keep doing it. Because you hear all the time, people uh, will tell you that, you know, I tried, then I stopped. Because people have relapses. This is the truth. It's, it's not all... Uh, up ahead and downhill or straight up. No, life is complicated. We we have um, stress in our lives, and sometimes we turn to food. What I have, what I have been trying to do is to tell people that it's important the continuity of this process, the um, consistency is crucial for you to start you know, detaching yourself from this emotional relationship with food. So the longer you stick with it, the better you will understand that this is all in your mind. I have been, and I am still, a food addict. But with proper nutrition, I control the addiction and not the other way around. So yeah, this mosaic that you're, you're talking about, this mosaic, this mosaic was some sort of tribute for all those people who are out there trying to find a way into their own health. And there are so many people in this, these carnivore groups. And I feel like we need to inspire people 
And if my if my testimonial, if my if my words can in some way inspire, even if it's only one person, then I am glad about it. Really, I am really really happy about it. That's amazing. That's such a great answer. It's so thoughtful. I love how much intention you bring to your message and and your your nature of sharing and caring with people. It's just it's so awesome. We we do we try to do the same things, and boy, it's it's. It's just, it, it is very inspirational and um, I've taken so much from this conversation. I, I agree with you. If one person listens to this and sees a benefit, I'll be happy. And that person can start with me. I'm very glad that we sat down and had this conversation. What is one simple thing that you would leave with a listener that they could plug into their life immediately and start to see some benefit from? Difficult question, <laughs> but I like the challenge. Well, do not pay attention to the world out there. It's important to understand this uh, undeniable fact. Those who feed us, they do not care about our health. And those who take, our, those who take care of our health, they do not care about our food. So this is not the matrix. This is real. I mean, the matrix is real. There is a system. And you can wake up. The only way that you can take your health into your own hands is by opening your eyes. That's I, what I would say. I love that. Wow. Yeah, that's so well said. I love it. I hope that people can take that message to heart and really see some amazing benefits in their lives. Where would you like people to go to find your work? Well, there is Instagram, of course. Um, so um, my my Instagram is uh, carnivore I am. Um, I'm also on Facebook. Um, my name is complicated to spell, so it, it's uh, it's difficult, but it's preferably uh, Instagram for of course. So yeah, I think that uh, you can find me there. We can follow each other. and I'm following a lot of people because I like to follow carnivores, for example, who are just starting. I like to see their progress. And for me, it's really important that we we share our testimonials, you know. This anecdotal evidence cannot be ignored because people are experiencing benefits from the carnivore diet by the thousands. And a good scientist will not ignore this. So, um, I mean, this is not too good to be true. It's really true. And I'm not trying to sell anything because I'm not even in this for the money. Because, uh, I mean, honestly, coaching is, is very, very, very interesting, but it's not something that I see myself doing exclusively for the financial benefit. My goal is to help people and maybe, maybe I'm thinking about writing a book. I think it can be a good idea. Wow. Um, so yeah, find me on Instagram, carnivore I am. That's amazing. <laughs> We will link up. To I that. hate advertising myself. <laughs> it's totally fine. You're not selling anything. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Joao Franco, thank you so much for appearing on the show. This was a wonderful conversation and we really appreciate you and your time. Thank you, Case. It was amazing to be here with you and uh, I hope we will talk soon again. Absolutely. And this has been another episode of Boundless Body Radio.